And that's the reason why when you go on these boats, there's always one guy that catches 12 fish, you know, and there's some people struggling, struggling to get bit once. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Benji, and tonight we're gonna to be continuing our Bluefin Tuna series that we started with Bluefin Rods and Reels. Today we're gonna to be kicking off three to four different episodes, breaking down separate Bluefin rigs and techniques. So for this episode, we're gonna be talking about how to fly line for Bluefin Tuna. In the following episodes, we're gonna be covering the sinker rig as well as the knife jig. So be sure you subscribe if you haven't already. When we get 300 likes on this video, I'll release the next video in this series. I'm joined tonight by my friend Anthony at Save on Tackle. When it comes to fly lining, it's just simply using a hook and putting your bait on and leaving your reel in free spool and uh, just waiting for, for the fish to bite. So there's also nuances when it comes to helping you get bit. And one of those things could be uh, the, the line that you're using. So Anthony, you wanna talk about whether you use mono, fluorocarbon, and uh, what size line class and how that matters and makes a difference? Absolutely, yeah. I guess there's a few different options. We can go straight braid to fluorocarbon, we can go braid to mono to fluoro. What you guys decide to do is pretty much up to you. Everybody's got their own recipe, if you will, and they all seem to work. So if it's uh, not broken for you, don't fix it. One of my favorite ways to do it is I'm fishing straight braid to some fluorocarbon leader. And what I'm doing is if, we, if you're setting up like that, you want to adjust your drag accordingly. Don't fish your drag like you're fishing straight mono with a lot of stretch. You know, we have to back off a little bit and uh, accommodate for the fact that we're taking a lot of that stretch fractor out. A couple of the things we're looking for, uh, there's different brands, uh, different, even different series within the brands. Some of them are gonna be a little stiffer, some of them are gonna be a little softer, uh, some will have more abrasion resistance, uh, and some will be a little bit softer, a little bit thinner, and they'll break a little bit truer to what they're rated at. Some of the brands that I use are the, uh, the Daiwa J Fluoro, huge fan of it, it's a nice soft line, great for fly lining especially when they're being a little more line shy. Seaguar has made some incredible stuff. They've kind of been some industry leaders in the uh, fluorocarbon scene for a while now. They're blue label, definitely having some better abrasion resistance when the fish aren't being as line shy. It's a great option. And then we have the gold label and the gold label is gonna be their thinnest, softest line. So definitely really, really good bait, bait pet presentation when the fish are feeling, uh, or they're being a little more picky that day. So Anthony, when you talk about, <coughs> when you say the word soft, what exactly do you mean by that? So some of the lines will be real stiff, real rigid, and some of them will be a little bit more supple. So if you try to stand up a, a three inch or four inch piece of it, it'll start folding over instantly. Whereas maybe with some of them, it'll stand straight up. And the benefit to you know, a nice soft line is it's gonna let your bait swim a little bit more naturally with a lot less resistance. The downside is most soft lines have less abrasion resistance and tend to be a little bit thinner and break truer to what they're rated at. Which isn't a problem, but you might say, well, the 30 pound blue label is stronger than the 30 pound gold label. Well, technically that's true. It's also a thicker, stiffer line. So somebody with 30 pound gold label might get bit better than somebody with 30 pound blue label. And you know, half the battle is getting bit. So if we can get bit more on the gold label, that's the one we want to use. If we're getting bit just fine on the blue label, then that'll give us a little bit more leeway, a little more forgiveness. So sometimes guys will take both options. Sometimes guys just develop a preference. For me, I typically on my lighter line go with the thinner, softer stuff. And as we ramp up, maybe 40, 50, 60 pound, they tend to not mind as much. I'll, you'll usually find me uh, fishing the, the stiffer, more abrasion resistant stuff. I Maybe if we're targeting 100 pound bluefin on lighter line, maybe 40 pound, I'll definitely want to go to something a little bit uh, with more abrasion resistance. So bottom line is you're, you wanna choose the line class based on the type of tuna that are out there and how finicky the fish are being that day. So if they're schoolie sized tuna, 30 to 40 pounds, um, starting off with 30 pound test might be that's a great a good idea. Yeah, that's a great starting point. We don't know what, what we're gonna stumble on, you know, especially right now. Some of the boats are coming in with anywhere from, you know, 15 to 250 pound fish. So, I mean, that's a huge range. And it's just a matter of what school did you stop on? And you might stop on a school and, you know, you're catching 20 to 50 pounders and 100 yards away, they're catching 200 pounders. There, it's not a, you know, it's not one boat better than the other boat or anything. It's just, what school did you get lucky to stop on? So having, having the arsenal set up, if you're fishing 30 and you're having a hard time get bit, drop down to 25, you know, and if you're still having a hard time, drop down to 20. Some of the guys will drop down to 15 on, on a nice sunny day and it's struggling to get bit, but you're seeing a lot of surface activity on smaller grade fish, they'll drop down to 15 or 17 if they can find it. 
Yeah, and then also if it's like a wide open bite and you're using 30 but you're getting you mauled, then yeah, then bump up. Might as well just bump up to 40 <laughs> or 50. No, that's it. You know. So last question before we actually move on to the hooks, which I'm, maybe a lot of you guys are waiting for. What is your go-to connection knot from Braid to Floro? I know everyone's got their own preferences. <laughs> I tie the RP because it's the only connection knot I know. But what's your preferred connection knot? So the the one I use the most is going to be the improved Albright. It's a very simple knot to tie. Whether your hands are wet or it's windy, it's it's very easy to tie. It's nice and slim. It goes through the guides well, and it and it holds up. I I use it anywhere from my trout stuff all the way up to my bigger bluefin. The right answer to that is the knot you know the best is going to be the best knot for you to tie. That's exactly what I was going to say, and I was going to ask you for confirmation if that's true or not. It's but. true. <laughs> if you tie a knot well, don't learn a new knot and, and try to, you know, break it in on a big fish. Take your time, tie the knot, put it on a drag scale or, or find some way to test it. Go to your local tackle shop and ask if they'll help you test your knots. Everybody should be willing to help you test a knot. Yeah, so practice makes purpose. Perfect. So practice <laughs> makes perfect, but thank you so much for that, Anthony. Now. A lot of people are asking, you're getting ready for your very first bluefin tuna trip, and I got a lot of comments in the last video on the Rod and Reel video of people saying, hey, I got my first setup at Save on Tackle, Anthony helped help me out, and I'm going on my first trip, my first day and a half trip this summer. So you guys are frantically learning what to do. You're obviously getting ready for a fly line setup. There's so many different hooks to choose from. So Anthony's gonna kind of break down what kind of hooks you should have and be prepared for when you go on that boat? So uh, there's there's a bunch of brands out there. Gamagatsu, Owner, VMC, Mustad. There's there's a lot of really, really good options. Uh, pretty much all the tackle stores carry at least a couple of those brands. So they're very, very easy to find. In that arsenal on the circle hook side, I definitely recommend going from number four, which is gonna be a four without a zero after it. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest questions we get uh, in the tackle shop. I've got a number two hook, right? A 2 and a two are very different. If there is a number without a zero, the bigger the number, the smaller the hook. If there's a hook with a zero after it, the slash and the zero, the bigger the number, the bigger the hook, right? So we just wanna keep track of what hooks we actually have because if we're telling you, hey, the boats are telling us a lot of number twos are being used, that's a much smaller hook than a 2.0 by at least two sizes. So you could be going out there with a hook two sizes too big or a hook two sizes too small. So pay attention to the packaging, make sure you understand your hooks. The other thing is between the different brands of hooks, there's definitely mm -hmm. some size variation, right? So a, a Gamagatsu number two and an owner number two are not the same size hook. So what you wanna do is definitely look at the hooks and don't necessarily go by a strict number. But if everybody, if they're talking about a number two owner or they're telling you that your bait is four inches, we want to find a hook that will accommodate a four inch bait. The best resource is to always call the landing and, and just check with the landing. What, what size hooks are they using on these tuna trips? What size is the bait? And kind of get some good feedback. But to solve the problem, you could kind of get the range from a number four to a 2.0 circle hook. On my J hooks, the J hooks tend to run a lot less material. So you could start at a number two. You don't have to go all the way down to a four typically. You could start at a number two and go up from there if you want to use a J hook. But definitely for the circle hook, there's a lot more material to, to make that hook. So uh, with that added weight, we'll go down to a number four. Not all hooks are made equally. And what that means, you might get like a, a Mutu circle hook from owner is gonna be my example tonight, and then a Mutu hybrid. You know, the, the, the gauge of wire is very different on those two hooks. They make a Mutu light and then they go up to a Super Mutu, right? And they're all, they're both a 2.0 but they're not gonna hold the same amount of pressure. We wanna kinda gauge what size fish we're catching. Are we catching 200 pound bluefin or are we catching 20 pound bluefin? And like I said, you know, we don't necessarily know till we get out there, but maybe on your 40 pound setup, go with a regular Mutu, and maybe on your 30 pound setup, since we're not gonna put a lot of drag, we could get away with going to the Mutu hybrid. Uh, so if you, you get a, a hook that's too thin, it'll flex out right away, and even though it says 2.0, and it bends too easy, you're gonna lose your fish every time. So yeah, if you're brand new and you're you know heading on maybe your first or second tuna trip, uh, fly lining is probably gonna be the way to go to start, and so it's something that you're gonna wanna do. It takes a, you know, it's a very simple technique, but it takes some getting used to in terms of really doing it in a way that's gonna entice a bite. Can you quickly show us how maybe the correct way to hook a bait and maybe some tips in terms of choosing bait in the bait tank? 
Yeah, absolutely. We grabbed a, uh, I grabbed a, a plastic. This is probably the closest thing I had in the store to a, a, a sardine, just with showing some of the fins and stuff. What I was going to do is tie on a hook. So maybe we'll show you guys, you know, the recommended knot for your hook, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll show you guys rigging the the bait on there. So it is a variation of the clinch knot. It's a very simple knot, but it is uh, affectionately called the San Diego Jam Knot. Uh, that is where it is uh, most commonly used. Yeah, It's one of the strongest knots you can use. Some of the guys like a polymer knot, whatever knot you tie the best, but I'm a huge fan of the San Diego. The line goes through the eye, folded over. I like to put my uh, ring finger in the middle right there to keep the hook out of the way and keep the lines nice and straight. Give yourself a decent little tag end. And then what you want to do is you want to wrap it around. Uh, you can figure out the hand configuration for the best dexterity for you, but you want to go around about five or six times, and then you're going to go through the base, and then you're going to bring it back up through the top. Okay? Hook rolled through there. And then you're just going to gently cinch that down. You want to get the line nice and wet at this point before you cinch it down tight because you don't want to burn the line and weaken it. Just that friction of cinching it down will definitely burn it. But for now, we're just going to cinch it down just like that. When we pin it on our bait, you're going to grab your bait. So, And that's a huge thing. We'll go over that here in a little bit, how to grab your bait out of the hand well. That is probably the biggest part of uh, getting bit out there. But the two techniques you're gonna see a lot, the crew will kind of go over with you. One is gonna be if we're seeing a lot of tuna on the surface, splashing around, we like to nose hook the bait. Nose hooking the bait is gonna typically keep that bait up a little bit higher. If they're not, the captain's telling you we're metering good fish maybe at 100 feet, 120 feet, or if we're seeing a lot of hungry birds, right? Especially after big winds, we see a lot of hungry birds out there and they keep grabbing our bait and we don't get a chance to get away from the boat. What we'll do is we'll belly hook the bait. Uh, they'll call it butt hooking, belly hooking, whatever. It's gonna be on the belly side of the bait and that's gonna be a technique that causes the bait to swim more down and out. And that'll allow us to keep it away from the birds and maybe get it down into those fish's faces a little bit better. So the nose hook is gonna be very simple. Forward of the eyes, but in between the, the lips on the sardines, you're gonna see a little clear triangle. What you're gonna to wanna to do is take your hook put it right in that little triangle, right about there, and run it through. As soon as you run it through, one of the most important parts, let go of the bait. <laughs> uh, you don't need to hold the bait to the rail, that bait will be just fine. Hold him just like that, try to keep all his scales intact without beating him up or stressing him out. So we'll walk up to the rail like that and we'll cast him out. When you cast it out, the hook will kinda fold back over or stay up top like this and he'll be swimming around. So when those fish grab them and start running, that circle hook will roll right in the corner and hopefully you get to land a nice fish. The other technique, like I said, the belly hook or the butt hook, there's a couple ways to do it, but the way, my favorite way, right on the belly, you're gonna see two fins. Underneath those fins, there's gonna be a hard little plate. One of the most frustrating things is you find the perfect bait, you pin it through the belly, you go to cast it, and it falls right off instantly. You're left with a backlash half the time and you just lost out on a great bait that you knew for sure was gonna get you bit. So what you want to do is right here where the fins are, there's a little plate underneath the stomach that, that help keep those fins in place. Uh, what you want to do is take that hook, run it right under those fins, and you don't want to go too deep where you're, you're puncturing their, the organs in their belly, but just under that hard bone. So it's going to come out like that. And then you're going to take them and you're going to just hold them again, let go of them, let them flop around all crazy, walk up to the rail, Typically with this, because they're gonna swim down, you wanna, you wanna get them out away from the boat a little bit, but you don't have to cast them super far. So just walk up and a nice gentle underhand toss typically keeps that bait on your hook a lot better. That bait hits the water. If you, if you get some practice in with it, that bait should be hitting the water facing out almost every time, hit and take off like a bullet going down and out. That way you don't have to worry about that bait turning around and coming back under the boat and getting caught with other people or getting caught in the running gear. I typically look to see where the deckhand is throwing bait. He's staying on the bait tank and he's throwing bait off of a corner. I'm watching where that bait's landing and I'm gonna toss my bait up in that direction. Cause that's typically where the tuna are gonna kind of congregate and wait for that next sardine to get thrown to them. So I think as Anthony mentioned, one of the most crucial aspects is actually handling the bait without damaging. Um, the bait fish are real fragile and they die really quickly and easily. I've gotten better at it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm still not great. Uh, one of the first trips that I went on, um, I was grabbing bait and at the end of the day, the butt of my rod was completely glittering with, with scales. <laughs> 
um, just because I was grabbing those baits and trying not to let them slip out of my hand, and then I was grabbing the butt of my rod. So, I um, mean, yeah, I was just killing all my bait, and I just threw time just gently taking them out under, holding them real gently, um, hooking and getting on the water as fast as possible. Really, really simple, not complicated, but just something that over time you get better with. Every single time I felt like, wow, this is a really good bait. Like this is a really good bait. And I tossed it out there and I saw that bait shooting out and the free spool was just going out. Almost every single time that's happened, I've gotten bit. Yep. And, um, and I just feel like it, it's just so important. And that's the reason why when you go on these boats, there's always one guy that <laughs> catches 12 fish, you know, and there's some people struggling, struggling to get bit once. Yeah. And so um, it's, it seems to be really, you know, simple, but just take some time to learn. Yeah, bait selection is everything. Bait handling is, is the second half because after the best bait is found, you still got to handle it properly so he doesn't become the worst bait in the bunch. And definitely, like you said, once you cast that bait out and you leave it in free spool, there's some cool little tricks to that fly line. If you cast your bait out and you just feel like it's not swimming really well, it's not pulling the line off nicely for you, uh, use your hand and just gently feather back on that spool and try to pick up some of the loose line gently without stressing him out. And as it starts vibrating and, and starting to tug gently at them, it'll usually create a little frantic burst out of them and they'll dart off. And sometimes that's enough to trigger one of those tuna to, to come up and, and eat it real quick. Change your bait semi-frequently. You don't need to change it every 30 seconds. Every once in a while, somebody gets bit on the long soak, but typically most of those bites happen when those fish congregate around the boat. They congregate on that chum line that the deckhands are throwing overboard and just having a bait swimming in that chum line is gonna have the best chance of success. Yeah, it's the adrenaline rush and why so many <laughs> of us like to jump on these boats is you feel that bait swim in real good and the free spool's running and then out of nowhere, it starts shooting out and it's burning out on you. What do we do from there, Anthony? You, you, you're, you're in free spool and you see that bait getting eaten and it's taken off, do you swing? What do you do? <laughs> Um, that's a great question. Uh, you don't need to bass master it. You don't need to, you don't need to set the hook all crazy. These fish are typically hitting that bait going really fast. You'll feel that line cut peeling off your reel really quickly. Uh, count to three, count to four, just nice and slow. One, two, three, click it up in gear and just go to the side a little bit or come up just a little bit and with a little umph, but not a full hook set. Those fish are going fast. That hook's already in their mouth. When you lift up, it slides into the corner and they're already going so fast, they're putting more pressure on that than a hook set's gonna do. So just let them come tight with it, have it in gear with just a little umph, just to make sure that hook's buried home nicely. And usually when they turn a little bit, it really sinks in. And you know, let them have their first initial run, you know, let them get gas themselves out a little bit. And then when they stop, wind as hard as you can and try to gain as much of that line back before they decide to go down and do those big long circles that we all have come to love and hate at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a real brief overview. Again, very, very simple, but again, so many little nuances to this game that you kind of pick up over time. So again, if you have any questions, come to Save on Tackle, talk to Anthony or any of the guys um, in the shop, and they're very, very helpful and knowledgeable. And Anthony and I say it every single time, no matter what, uh, support your local shop. So if you're not near Save on or you have your local shop, Go there, continue to support them. That's what yep. it's all about is uh, we are here to help, continue to help this fishing industry thrive. So thank you so much, Anthony, for sharing all your knowledge, especially with this video. And again, this is part two of our four to five part <laughs> Bloop and Tuna series. We're gonna shoot one right after this. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel already, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. The next video is gonna be on the sinker rig. And also, if you haven't checked out our video on bluefin tuna rods and reels, be sure to check it out right here so you don't miss out and you can get caught up on all the gear. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Until next time, tie lines.